somewhere in the distance I heard the hammering as they drove the nails in his hands and
I am a fool, wayfaring stranger, traveling through this world of woe. I have no fear, no torn or danger in that bright land. I go. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there to Rome. I'm only going. We go over to. Gather round me. I know my way is rough and steep. Oh, but beauty of spills lie just before me, where God redeems their vigiled speed. I crawl, I'm only going, being over children, I'm only going, over
Well, I'm kind of home Sick for a country To which I've never been before No sad goodbyes Will there be spoken And time won't matter anymore. You love land I'm longing for you. And someday on the I'll stand. I'm looking out across the river where my faith will end inside. There's just a few more days to labor. Then I'll take my heavenly flight. You love land I'm longing for you, and someday on the I'll stand. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone out to Hickox Baptist Church this morning. I'll ask Brother Lamar to Prater if you will to open us in prayer. Amen. September the 6th, Sunday school resumes. It's on Sunday morning, September the 6th, Sunday school resumes. September the 13th, we'll have a church conference. If there's any of our church family that's in college, please let their names and addresses, please get their names and addresses to the church office or to Miss Diane Lyons. We do a little care package for them. So if you get them names to the office or Miss Diane. <clears throat> There's a note in the bulletin that says to my church family, thank you all so much for the prayers for Bill and my family during this time of sorrow. Thank you most of all to those who helped with the meal you prepared and served for us. I am humbled as I've not ever been on the receiving end of such kindness. Please continue to keep my family in your prayers, the family of Mr. Bill Gillis. I'll be asking the ones that teach Sunday school if they're going to continue to teach and different things. So I'm just preparing, y'all. I'm coming. But uh, thank you for being here this morning. There'll be no choir practice today. And uh, Brother Ronnie Cruz told me this morning that Miss Anna Roden passed away at 2 o'clock in the morning. So y'all keep that family in prayer.
I want to say uh, I appreciate you coming out to the Hickox Baptist Church. You that are watching us by YouTube or Facebook and on the Internet, we welcome you to worship God with us. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We all are like goats. We butt our own heads, and sometimes we get bloody. But Jesus said, there's a better way. I can fix it for you. So we, we are going to help you with Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Brother Scott's out today. He's having a procedure next week, and let's be in prayer for him that he has good results. And uh, let's stand as we sing the days of Elijah. Everybody sing out loud. <clears throat> These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sorrow, When the roll is called a thunder 
time, if we can greet everybody, one's on the, this side, wave to these on this side, and one on this side, the same thing. Good morning. I'm about ready to quit that, ain't y'all? Yeah, really. <laughs> Remain standing, we have one more song. In His Time. <laughs> It's good to see each one of you here this morning. Uh, as we begin to talk about the message for today, uh, turn with me to Exodus uh, chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Try to catch everyone up where we's at. This is like three times or two times in a row. This will be the third uh, session of Exodus. It's talking about the story and the life of Moses. Uh, remember, Moses was born in a day when the Pharaoh of Egypt was wanting to kill all the male children. And uh, Moses' mama, being led by the Spirit of God, uh, put him in a little basket. And uh, the Bible says that she put him in the little ark. We refer to that as the ark of safety. She pitched it within and without and then set him in the river there. And his sister watched him as he would float down the, the river there. As God would have it, Pharaoh's daughter came. And she saw the basket as she was preparing to take a bath. Uh, It's been a long time since I took a bath in the river, but uh, good things may happen. We might need to try that. Uh, Anyway, went down there, saw him, fell in love with the child. The child's mother was asked to come and nurse the child and get payment for it and still his life being killed. We know God was in that. God was in that all the way, you know, and... uh, uh, as we find that, you know, in the very short uh, scriptures there, just very few verses there, all of a sudden we find Moses is grown and he's serving uh, for the Egyptians. But yet in his heart he knew that he was an Hebrew uh, and there was a different calling on his life. He, he always had something else. We know he killed an Egyptian soldier there and, and Pharaoh found out uh, what he had thought he had hid and Moses had to flee for his life. And we find Moses in the land of Midian over there in a desert place. There where he ran upon some sheep uh, herders that was doing uh, uh, watering their sheep. And it happened to be uh, a man who only had girls. His name was Jethro. And as they began to water their sheep, some shepherds came and uh, strong-armed the the ladies and run them away from there. And Moses stood up and defended them and uh, held them at bay while he drew the water. And anyway, the love story began as he was called to the house of Jethro uh, and had been there a little while. Then he is handed his wife and they have a son. Now, uh, I believe that uh, Moses was content. you got to remember he was in the seat of royalty in the land of Egypt, although he was not liked really by a lot of them. Some 
knew by his actions uh, where he really came from. He was really not an Egyptian. Uh, he was a Hebrew by birth. Uh, and let me tell you, that blood runs strong in God's uh, veins. As we see the story develop here, uh, Moses was content to be a sheep herder, but little did he know God was grooming him to be a tremendous shepherd, a tremendous shepherd. And uh, we find as he goes and he comes in and out, uh, as he feeds the, and uh, takes care of the, the sheep and, and uh, all the things that he's done, and he has a wife and a son, I mean, this is a ready-made thing. He stands to inherit all that Jethro had, maybe, uh, with all the other family members there. But God's plans was different. Sometimes we get content in the state that we are in, and we don't think, God, we, you know, we're just going to do this for the rest of our life. Uh, I don't know about you, but it seems to me like the older I get, the quicker the weeks go by. Uh, and, and, you know, and not only that, the months go by. And not only that, I mean, I have a board meeting once a month uh, with the co-op, and it seems like I have them every other week. It seems like I have a birthday every six months. Uh, is that normal? I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm old enough to realize that. Brother Charlie, is there anything to that? There ain't nothing to that? Okay. Thank you, Brother Charlie. I had to ask someone who just, you know, graduated a few years ahead of me to find that out. But anyway, it seems like time is passing by so fast. You know, I believe what the scripture tells us, that you're going to do, you better do now because uh, the evening is coming. The sun is going to set in our life, in your life. But I believe King Jesus is going to come back uh, even before all that. But Anyway, having said that, kind of get you up to snuff to where we're going to be. If you have found Exodus chapter 3, stand with me as we uh, honor the reading of God's holy inspired word. It says this, it says, Now Moses kept the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of the Midian, and he led the flocks in the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horab. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Do you get that? There was a bush on fire that was not consumed being consumed. Have you ever witnessed that in your life? No. Uh, the folks in California wish that it didn't happen that way because they're about to burn off the face of the earth over there. This bush was burning and it was not consumed. I believe it would stir my interest, wouldn't it yours? Let's pray. Father, this morning, God, as we have stood before your people before and as we stand today, I pray for the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God, that we would say the things, Lord, that would fill our soul full of joy, peace, and security in the love that Jesus has for us. God, we hope today that we'll leave here a different person than the way we came. God, we pray, Lord, you'd have your willing way in every aspect of this song, the songs, uh, every aspect of the message, God, when we depart from here, that we'd be satisfied with you and you would be satisfied with us. God, go with us now. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. It's amazing how God just kept ordering the footsteps of Moses in the past that we go. We go back earlier. He ordered his mama to put him in a, a little uh, man-made little uh, boat, if you will, an ark, and he was found. So it was ordered by the Lord that he would be found. Not only that, that he would find himself uh, very near and close to Pharaoh. Uh, we know that the old Pharaoh died and a new one came in the hardship of the Egyptian uh, uh, hard hearts of the Egyptian people began to oppress uh, the children of God there in, uh, in Egypt, and God was uh, hearing their prayers. I believe you heard them all the time, but you know, sometimes God's got to get us to a point that where we can listen to Him. He hears us all the time, but he'll say, well, you're not quite ready yet. You know, you're not quite ready yet. And then he comes to that point where he says, okay, it sounds like and I feel like you're ready. So this man Moses was reared up. God knew uh, years before that it was going to happen and the way it did happen. Moses goes to uh, flee for his life and is found in a desert place here. And now he's married to a woman and he's starting to feed the sheep. Little did he know that probably Moses was taking the sheep out a little bit further than the girls was because of those uh, irate uh, other herdsmen that were around there, how that they may do them, being they were all women. 
So uh, we find out that he goes be to a desert place behind to where this mountain Horeb was to find some pasture and all like that. And here we find out that he's going to encounter God. That's a great time in your life when you encounter God. When God shows himself, you don't know why you are where you're at, but there you are and here, here he is. And there God presents himself in a miraculous way. We see here that as uh, he, was, he, he was going in verse 2, it says the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a, in a flame of fire. How, how much uh, more powerful could God present himself? Can anybody tell me anything, uh, uh, just speak out, that is more uh, powerful than fire? Only one thing that I know of is water. Water can put out a fire. Uh, but fire cannot put out water. But as we know that the promise of God was that he would never destroy the face of the earth with water again. But what he would do is take the next thing that represents a tremendous power, he was going to use fire. And at this point here, you see that he speaks out, the angel of the Lord speaks out unto Moses from a flame of fire. Now, I want you to realize something that as we look at this picture uh, of what's going on, the thing that attracted Moses there, not only was there a bush burning, little did he know that this bush would not be, uh, it, it, the bush was burning but yet not consumed. That's what attracted him there. Little did he know that it was going to speak. Now, I'm going to tell you, I would run. You know, it was about like the prophet that time that the donkey had to inspire him by speaking in words that he could understand and rebuked him about going any further. As we look here, that interest that God had built inside of Moses got him interested in what was going there. He said, hmm, you know, uh, that would be something. I saw a little clip uh, on the news today that this, uh, this guy that was, uh, I guess he was a hiker or a runner or whatever out in California, and uh, uh, he was running and he saw this small fire out in this, uh, in this, they call it wooded area, and they call it kind of thick there, but it wasn't about this high, you know. They want to see thick, let them come. I'll carry them to the Oak Finoke Swamp. They'll really see thick. I'll carry them to some of these here gum ponds we got around here, and I'll show you something thick. But anyway, he spotted this little fire out there, and uh, uh, being the hero that he thought he was, he runs out there, and he begins to try to put the fire out. Now, the, the people has made him a hero because he about burned his tennis shoes off trying to stomp the fire out, and all he had was his tennis shoes and picking up dirt and taking bushes and knocking them things down and all like that. But ultimately, the fire prevailed, but yet this guy was a hero. Let me tell you, we're no match for fire. We're no match for fire. I mean, we know about fires. I mean, Oak and Oak Swamp has burned how many times and, and all like that, and... Some say the federal government could have put it out. Well, I'm going to tell you, they, they, could have, uh, they may could have at one time or another, but God's intent for it was to burn. You know, and uh, when it gets that hot, we back off and just fan and say, okay, Lord, when you decide for us to get ahead of this thing, we will not until then. Can we do anything about it? So the fire was a powerful thing. But this little spark that Moses saw up there as he was going somewhere he had never been, that drew interest into him. He says, that's amazing. There's a bush on fire up there, but I, I believe that he saw it more than one day. I believe he went by there and saw it a couple of days. You know, how did he know? He says, he going to go see this thing. You know, that's what he says. I'm going to go see this thing that up there that's got my interest. This is a little further in the Word. And it says, and, and, the, and, and the bush burned with fire and the, and the brush was not consumed. He says this in verse 3, And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight uh, while the bush is not burnt. You know, I, that would be an amazing thing. You know, there's no way that you could prove to me or someone just told me uh, out of their own mouth that uh, they seen a bush that was burning and it didn't turn to ashes very soon. I mean, no, no way I could believe that. And that's what stirred the interest of, uh, of Moses. He says, I'll turn aside. Now, what you got to realize here, here was the turning point. He's turned aside. But the turning point in Moses' life from being a shepherd of sheep to becoming shepherds of people. He turned aside the things of Jethro, and now he's turning his, uh, his way toward the things of God at that very moment. At that very moment. And, the, and his curiosity usually kills the cat, right? So he goes up, and uh, he's going to leave the sheep, which no good shepherd never does. 
but he leads the sheep and he goes to investigate what was this mysterious thing. And he notice in verse 4, he says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, did you hear me? When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside. What does that mean? He left that thing that was most uh, desirable and most responsible for him to do to come and see what God was doing. It had to be a God thing. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Moses knew that it was something to deal with God because it was a miraculous thing. A bush was burning and not being consumed. He even said that. But when the Lord seen that, he turned aside. He says, God called unto him in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said this, here am I. Here am I. Of course there he was. He just wanted him to know when he called his name. It's amazing that he knew his name. Don't you? That's amazing. You know, God knows your name. You know, uh, 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 there's, there's a lot of people in this world named James. I'm actually James, not Jamie. There's a lot of James. As a matter of fact, there's a book in the Bible named James. You know, but let me tell you, God knows me on a personal note. and He don't have to know my social security number. He knows me by my DNA because I'm a child of his. I gave my heart to him. The blood was applied and now I'm adopted into the family of God. He knows the difference between me and someone else over the millions of people that has lived on the face of the earth. He knows you by name. He can tell you how many hairs that are on your head. He knew who Moses was. He was ordained from before conception that he would use Moses in this situation. And he called him twice, Moses, Moses. That was to make sure that there was no mistake that he actually said Moses, Moses, Moses. He said, here am I. Because later on, Moses is going to ask him when, I, when he elects to do what God wants him to do. He says, you, who, are, who am I going to tell him that sent me? He says, you tell him that the I am sent me. I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. You know, it's kind of like when my mama would start counting when she'd tell me things to do and, uh, and I wouldn't do it. And then she started counting. Usually she was counting stepping toward me with a limb, you know, and then I'd go, Mom, you better, I am, Mama, I am, I am, I am. So I was about my business, you know. But here Moses, uh, when he called, he says, Moses, Moses, what else could he say? He knows I am. But I picture Moses climbing up side of Mount Horeb to see this thing going to sneak up there. I mean, there's got to be some mysterious something going on, something powerful, you know, uh, what would we call that, maybe extraterrestrial, is that a word? Anyway, you know, something like E.T., something out of space, something happened, a UFO, something happened and he wanted, I believe he snuck up there. I just don't believe he just bailed off up there. I believe he just walked up there and he began to, uh, to, to see that thing and all of a sudden, could you imagine the shock that he heard? His name being called. His name being called. I mean, absolutely, yeah, that would scare me to death. Have you ever, this, man, you see somebody in the store or somewhere and you really don't want to get, yeah, I know you do it because we all do it. You see them and you don't really want to talk to them that day. You know, maybe it's a bill collector and you want to pass by. So you, you, you sneaking around there and you look down that aisle, okay, they ain't down that aisle, oh, up there to come and you go this way. And all of a sudden, you think you got it made and you at the checkout counter and they say, hey, Brother Jamie, oh, oh. I've been recognized. Moses was recognized. Not that God had to wait all this time to know who he was, but he picked the time that Moses would, uh, that he would be giving God his undivided attention. And immediately he said, here am I. You know, there was more prophets than even him that said that when God called them. And one of them says, here am I, send me. Moses says, here am I. He don't know what it's about. He has no idea that God's fixing to send him uh, on, a, on a, a massive journey. I mean, a biblical thing that would save God's people from oppression. Notice in verse 5, and he, and he said, he said, draw not nigh hither. In other words, you're close enough, Moses. Draw not nigh hither. Don't come any far. It was kind of like he snuck up there, peeped around the rock, and there that bush was. And when he did that, God says, Moses... He says, here am I. He says, don't come any closer. Well, little did he know there was a reason why God wouldn't, didn't want him closer. Sometimes we get ourselves a little bit close to God, closer than our sinful nature would allow us to go there, and God speaks to us and we kind of panic. We kind of wonder, well, 
I don't know if I'm, you know, I, all, all you're doing is thinking all the things that you've done that you shouldn't have done. And Moses is here. He says, all I wanted to do was see what was going on. All I wanted to do was just get up here. But he got too close. He got a little too close. And the Lord spoke to him. He says, don't come no closer. Why in the world would he do that? Well, I got, I, I, I got the answer. I'm glad you asked me that because I wanted to answer this. And he says, he said, draw not nigh. He says, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. What made that a special place? Well, number one thing that made it a special place, God was there. Now, he wasn't there in, in, in the body of Christ. He, he wasn't there in his body. If God's got a body, I mean, God is whatever God is. Uh, I, all I am, I, all I can tell you, he just is and just was and is to come. He is. But he was there. No man had looked upon God. No man, and I think everybody would be scared to death to look upon God with the eyes that we have. We would have fleshly blindness if we looked upon God in, his, in his, all of his glory and all of his beauty and all of his majesty and all of his whatever you could describe him to be. His magnificence was there when they saw God. One day we're going to see. And the Bible says when he shall appear, we shall see him as he is. We'll have on those spiritual glasses that allow us to see who God really is. Aren't you glad? You know, I don't know if everybody that uh, is not saved or don't believe in Christ, I don't know if they'll ever see him as he is because from what I read, what he is is what I want. I want love. I want kindness. I want a place that he's prepared for me. I want the, to spend eternity with a man and, I, and, and no one I've only met through the Spirit. I've never laid eyes on him, but yet I want to dwell with him forever. He spoke to Moses. He says, Moses, man, he said, don't come no closer. Don't come no closer. I wonder if this was the closest that a, 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 the, the, the human had ever gotten to God in the flesh. It's the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. And I believe the world began when, in Genesis 1, don't you? I don't believe there was no million years before all that and all this stuff. Of, I believe it began then. Now, how old is God? I don't know. He just was. You know, they didn't nothing blow up and God appeared. If anything blowed up, God spoke to it to blow up. So we find here that he is maybe as close as any human had ever been at that time in the flesh. And it was a voice speaking through there. But he knew it was God because God knew who he was. Now we look here, he says, to do something. He says, take your shoes off, Moses. You know, I often wondered that. I often wondered. You know, I, I, was, I was at the house thinking this morning. You know, the grandbabies was there and, uh, Jan was getting them all ready, and, and, and I was rehashing that stuff. And, and I was outside swinging Tadpole and Emerson this morning early because it was my turn to babysit while she got ready to go to church. And we was a swinging and, and all like that. While I was swinging, I was thinking, and this all come out, you know, because I made Emerson go get her little Crocs on to go outside to get on the swing. I toted Tadpole so he wouldn't have to get on the ground. He wouldn't have to do all that. So we all had shoes on except him. But I wonder why God would say something uh, to him to take his shoes off. And, you know, I begin to think why was that important. Listen, God don't want anything to come between you and him that would block you, the full uh, appearance, the full atmosphere of God. Yeah, for number one, it was a reference thing. It's kind of like the way I feel about the house of God. You come into the house of God, gentlemen, I expect your hats to be off. Not to, not to reverence me, but it's a holy place. And where God is, there is holiness. And where he is should be reverence. And we should acknowledge that very thing. Not the building. We're not praying to the building. We're not dipping our hat to the building. We're not doing all that. But it's where God comes and meets with his people. It's a holy place. And Moses, he's told to take his shoes off. I, want, I, I believe because of, no, of Moses, he didn't want anything to come between. He wanted Moses to have the full effect of the presence of God. You know, it was common in those days what God, what Jesus done to his disciples. You know, uh, they journeyed. They wore sandals in those days, and, and it was dirty ro dirt roads. There wasn't no paved roads. You know, there wasn't nothing like that. You know, bless God, we got a brand new road where I live. <laughs> If y'all had known it before and after, you'd have thanked God had done come and paved the road. 
It was a blessing. Ain't it, Sister Carolyn? She's got the same one I got. Praise the Lord. But it was dirt roads. It was often practiced that God would come in and, and he would set his disciples down and, and he'd take a, a, a bowl of water and a rag and, and he would take their sandals off and he would wash their feet. And I got to thinking about this. Man, Moses, you know, his feet were dirty. He was out there with the sheep and all like that. But God took him as he was. He took him as he was. And he says, take your shoes off, man. He says, take your shoes off. What did that mean at that time? Well, at that time when they took their shoes off, and especially when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who would die for them, washed the disciples' feet, they said, no, we should be doing this to you. He said, no, allow it to me. I've got to set the example. On the Mount Horeb, God set the example about the shoes being removed is you can be comfortable in my presence when as long as I'm here, everything is going to be all right. Not only that, even the soles of your feet now. The Bible don't speak about the soles of your shoes. The Bible speaks of the soles of your feet where you touch. If God is in control of your life, he says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And if they are, then your path is ordained by the Lord. And being in the presence of the Lord, you can take your shoes off. When people come to my house, if they want to take their shoes off, if they want to recline in the recliner chair, all that they can do, get up and go to my refrigerator or do whatever they need to go to my bathroom, lay on my bed, it makes me feel good because I feel like, they feel like they're at home. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And I think that was for Moses. He says, listen, Moses, you, this don't happen to many people, my friend. He says, we got to talk and you need to take your shoes off for where you stand. Woo, where you stand is the presence of God. Now, it, 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 you forget about the bush that's not burning. That's burning, but yet not being consumed. Forget about all that. I'm here to do business with you. This is just a little sample of how I operate. So why would God do Notice what else it says in the scripture there. That God didn't speak from that bush. He spoke, he spoke through the bush. You don't, don't get that mixed up. God was not the burning bush. God was not there. The burning bush separated God from the filth of this world. Nothing could penetrate that fire. But his voice came through there. The presence of God was there. And so he spoke through the fire. What happens when something goes through the fire? What you get is purity. How do they purify gold? With fire. How do they purify iron? Fire. How is God going to purify the earth one day? Fire. It's going to clean it. It's going to be, how do you, you know, I know y'all don't practice this, but back in the day, uh, mama was an also midwife, uh, uh, doctor, everything else. If you had a bad, something stuck in your foot, mama's going to operate. Yeah. You didn't run up there to the doctor. Pay $187 copay, get in there and cock your foot up there unless it was bad. And I had an ingrown toenail one time. I let Doc do that because Mama, she'd have killed me. Mama would have took my toe off. But I think what, what would happen, Mama would go in there and she'd take a, she'd take a, a cigarette lighter or, or a kitchen match. <sniffs> take one of them sewing needles. If y'all don't know what that is, we got some ladies who will teach you what a sewing needle is. You know, did that because they were long and they, she'd light that. Why did she put the flame? Some of y'all would turn the gas stove on and heat that thing up. Why would you do that? Are you burning a hole through there? No, 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 no. You didn't burn a hole through it. What you done, you got into the impurities off of that needle so that it went into your open wound there that it would not infect you in any kind of way. There's nothing could withstand. I don't believe the coronavirus could stand the flame of Almighty God's fire. If he spoke from heaven today... Through the burning bush, the, the co co coronavirus would have to leave. It would. 
I think in our lives, we got a lady sitting right there, first time back since she's had coronavirus. She's went through the fire, but not alone. God led her through the fire. You listen to her testimony. Even in the hospital, angels of people were around this lady. I'm telling you, God is with his people as he was with Moses that day. There's a decision fixing to be made that this man was going to lead millions of people out of bondage from an evil Pharaoh. And God proved himself. And he spoke through the fire. I always think about when you speak about that. Y'all remember the story of the three Hebrew boys? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Y'all remember them? Yeah. Evil man, Nebuchadnezzar. He was the one there. He built a golden image and, 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 and he believed in Daniel and, and the Hebrew boys. He believed in them, but yet he was coerced into building this 90-foot golden image that was very expensive and probably something to look at, but it was no power. It was just gold. And he said, if y'all don't bend and, and bow before it, when we sound the music, he says, you can be thrown into what? The fiery furnace. The fiery furnace. And they said, we're not careful to answer you, king, on these matters. He says, you know where we stand. I don't have to answer you. You know my answer. I will not bend. I will not bow to your golden image. But he gave them another chance, and they did not. And king got so mad, he said, heat this furnace one seven times hotter. I don't know if that's seven times hotter or 17 times hotter. It could have been 187 times hotter, and it still would have had the no effect on the boys that got through in there. They threw them in there, and amazing enough, who shows up in the fire with those guys? Well, we don't really know because we didn't see it, but one we do know was a wicked king, a man who had no God whatsoever in him. He recognized the works of God. He recognized the inhabitants of God, but he never trusted God. And he looked in there. He says, how many did we throw in there? They said, we throw three. He says, well, why do I see four? He says, you know what? That fourth man singled him out. Fourth man is looking like the son of God. Well, how did he know? Well, what gave it away? What was the secret ingredient? He says, the fire has no hurt on them. And I'm going to tell you, God spoke through a burning bush. God spoke through a fiery bush. He could have walked on hot coals. You know, I watch that on TV. Some of these foreign people, how they, you know, they got to be foreign. They're foreign out of their mind. You know, walk across a bed of coals. Act like it ain't nothing to it. There's something to that. I ain't never grabbed nothing hot. What didn't burn me? I mean, I don't know. I I don't know about you. I, I welded a lot and forget that a piece I just welded on and I reached over there and grabbed that baby and it lit me up. I mean, that, that's, you just can't say, well, I'll take it. You can't, you can't, you can't. But God spoke to a burning bush. God was in the burning fire with those boys, and it had no hurt on them. You know what happened down there? Not the boys was purified. They were purified before they went in there. That's why the fire had no hurt on them. They had the love of God in their heart. They trusted in him, what he could do and what he would do. He says, you may throw us in there, but we will never turn our backs on him. And ploop, and they went, and just shortly that, they ploop, they come out. And you know what was so amazing? You know, uh, Jarrett cooks a lot for us. He ain't in here right now. Jarrett cooks a lot for us. But, you know, uh, the best smell that I ever smelt on Jarrett is when he walks away from them cookers. You know, if we could bottle that up... uh, Miss Beth right here, she does Mary Kay. If y'all need any Mary Kay, she can help y'all out. If you could find Mary Kay and get them to put that smoked barbecue smell in a bottle. Hey, I'm, let me tell you, son, it, you may not be attracted to them physically, but if you got a hamburger to throw out there, they will eat you alive. You know, you smell somebody that's got that on them. You know where they're being. But the thing about it is these boys were thrown into their, uh, their doom. And they come out and they didn't smell like doom. The Bible says it had, there was no hair on them. Uh, the clothes, the hosing that was on them wasn't even swinged. Didn't have no smell of smoke on them. If that ain't God. God defies the obvious. 
God defies what we take for granted. Listen, if I go, if I go grill and I come in, my grandkids are going, Papa, you smell good. Now, don't you bite me. Don't you bite me. You smell good. Let me tell you what. You know what is smelling good? Is when you're walking in the fires of this life down here and you come out on the other end and you got a smile on your face and you got a praise for the one that brought you through. Let me tell you, that's something supernatural and that's special. Moses was called unto God that day. He was barefooted before the Lord, which means he was naked. There was nothing there that he could hide from God. God knew who he was, where he come from, and what he wanted him to do. And God knew that he would be the man that could do it. Even though Moses didn't think of himself as good as that. In the story, he spoke to, he spoke to Moses, and here's what his thing he said. He says, Moses, he says, the cries of the children of my people. You know, a lot of times he called, he called those my people. Did you know if you're born again, you're called my people? You're his people? You know. You know, it's funny how you can talk to some people in this world and say, oh, no, them, them's my people's. Them's my people's. Well, let me tell you, we're his people. Let me tell you, there, there's benefits from being there. I mean miraculous benefits being his people. He says, my people have called out. He says, and I've seen, I've heard their cries. He says, and I've seen the oppression of what the Egyptians do for them. He says, and I have chosen you to lead them out of their oppression today if we when we gave our heart to Jesus we were naked before him in other words he saw through the clothing the, he saw through the sinness of us and he saw the good in us the good that could be we weren't good then but when he worked on us we became good we became usable. As one word, we came meet, M-E-E-T, like a meeting. He came, or the word translated means fit. You, you, you follow me? We became fit for the kingdom of God. We weren't fit earlier. We couldn't meet earlier. But when Jesus came and cleansed us, we were fit for the kingdom of God. It's because he fitted us. He changed us. And he spoke to us, and it's his blood that did those things. His word as he spoke. You can't tell me. He, he didn't ever deny. He says, I, 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 boy, I've heard their cry a long time, and now I'm just getting around to it. No, 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 no. He says, I've seen. That, that, that's a past tense. I've seen. You know, uh, did y'all see anything on the way to work, on, on the way to church today? Anybody see anything? You didn't see another car coming? Well, you, you, you saw it. it, it it's gone. I, you ever heard anybody say, well, I, I have seen. Yeah, okay, that's in the past. He says, I have seen their affliction. So he's been seeing it for a long time. He's been seeing it for a long time. But the difference was at this point, he says they're being oppressed. You know, once upon a time, they wanted to be there. And now they don't want to be there. Listen, if you're not saved and you've never professed Christ as your Savior, you're that person that wants to be where you're at. But when you get tired of being in that number and you want Jesus to change your life and you're not sure of your destiny when you live, there's one thing we can do a lot of things in this life uh, to, to change where we live, uh, change what we eat, Change a lot of things, even about our body. We can change a lot of things. And we got an option to change our destiny. But if you don't change it through the help of the Lord Jesus Christ, then your destiny is sealed. And that's to go to hell without Christ. Now, I don't know about you. I've made preparations to miss that place. Now, I might not live it day by day. I might not be the shining example that I need to be, but I know who is. And I tell you what, I don't know anything about tomorrow, but I know who holds tomorrow. 
I don't know anything much about eternity, but I know who has eternity. I don't know anything about much heaven other than what I read in the Bible, but I can tell you this. I know who is the builder and the maker of heaven. And let me tell you something. If he was willing to do what the Bible says that he did for me, I'm all in. I did not deserve what he did for me. You know what? Furthermore, Moses didn't deserve this opportunity either. Don't forget, Moses murdered a man. Moses murdered a man. If everybody in here is one of them type of politically correct persons, let me tell you, God's fixing to use a murderer to lead his people out. He said, Brother Jamie, he had, he already, I, I'm not getting into that. He killed somebody. Okay? So did the world. The world killed somebody. And we were born into that. Our sins put Christ on the cross. Even though we didn't live when it happened. But our sins put him to the cross. So does that make us murderers? Absolutely. If it wasn't going to be for our sins. If it wasn't for our sins, he wouldn't have never had to do it. He said, well, now all that happened back then. I don't have nothing to do about it now. Well, it ain't none of us live very light. The Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We were born into iniquity. And our way out is Jesus. Our way out. Those way out is God, Moses being the leader. Who are we leading today? Are we leading our family? Are we leading the people we work with? Or do we lead a life that God says there's a good shepherd right there in his community? He, he leads people around. No, he don't go to this one and that one. That. He, don't go to all, he don't do all those things, but he leads, and his life is leading people in spite of where you believe it or not. We had, we had Tad Poe and Emerson over, and there's times... There's a lot of times that they want somebody besides Grandpa. And it was amazing. When it got kind of late yesterday evening, Tadpole don't call Mimi, Mimi good yet. But he has got one word down pretty good. And no, it ain't Papa. It's Mama. He's got that down. And when I couldn't do nothing with him, he was wanting mama. And his substitute was Mimi. So Mimi became mama. And that was sufficing him. Let me tell you. I watched that. I said, do you hear what he's calling me? Yeah, and she would tell him, say Mimi. But it wasn't the name he was wanting. He wanted that loving comfort. Apparently, I don't get him, or he's wanting. Let me tell you, there's a voice crying out to you today. You're wanting that type of love. And the Bible says the demonstration of Christ's love, the closest it can be, is that of a mother. And it's crying out from you today. And listen, what you got to do is what Tadpole done. When I wrestled him till I couldn't wrestle him anymore, I put him down on the floor and pity pat down the hallway in the dark to where the light was shining. All of a sudden, no more tears. He was where he wanted to be. And Jan was in there trying to get stuff. She looks down there at me and goes, really? <laughs> but I couldn't answer it. I couldn't satisfy, nor will this world satisfy you. What you're really needing and wanting is the love of God. Just watch your kids. Where will they go? They'll go to where they're comfortable and they feel like they're loved the most. We're God's children. We're God's people. We need to go where we're loved the most. Moses didn't know he was going to fall in love with an Ethiopian woman and then be drug out of there to go challenge a king. 
of a large nation. Not for the love of Jethro and his wife, Zephra, but for the love of God. We can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. Trust Him today. When He calls, say, here am I. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, God, we thank you for the illustration of Moses. God, the very presence you was in. I remember the day that you entered into my heart through the Spirit and asked me to be yours, and I accepted that. God, I, I hadn't had anything on to offer. But what you gave me, God, money can't buy. God, I pray under the sound of my voice today that we all have made that election sure. Not that we just went down there and got dunked by somebody. God, we said the right words and all that, but we had all that in our heart, right? We meant it in our heart. We didn't say it with our lips. We said it with our spirit. Because that's the only thing that's going to stand the test of time is that covenant between you and I and you and them. God, help us today make the right decisions. Before, because they are eternal decisions, not temporal. They're eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. says that he can cleanse each spot. I believe some people think that they've done some stuff that God cannot forgive. I'm telling you, the only thing that God can't forgive is you never accepting him. He cannot forgive that. Anything else to him is a piece of cake. He says, ask and it shall be given unto thee. Forgiveness, mercy and grace. Hope you have a great day. Eat a lot, take a nap, and come back at 6, okay? All right, everybody good with that? Brother Robert, dismiss us, please, sir.